welcome to another episode of In Moments Like These with David Graham. David is a speaker, author, businessman, former pastor, and founding director of Youth of a Mission, Montana. We believe that God is at work, constantly tugging at our hearts, working in and through relationship around us. Join us as we dive into a new devotional, as David shares a lifetime of personal moments and hopes to inspire you to see God the Father at work in your own moments. Thank you for joining us on today's episode of In Moments Like These. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I don't give to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled, and don't be afraid. John 14, 27. I shared that verse in our last episode, such wonderful, such comforting words, which were preceded by these words of Jesus in verses 25 and 26. I have spoken these things to you while I remain with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I have told you. And at that point is when he went on to say, Peace I leave with you. Peace I give to you. So on the night before he was crucified, Jesus assures his followers that they wouldn't be left alone because his Father and our Father would be sending the Holy Spirit to them, to us, and that the Holy Spirit would become the ongoing purveyor of peace to us, and much more. And today, I feel I'm supposed to share more about the wonderful role of the Holy Spirit in our lives in these difficult days we live in. I'm going to start by reading one more devotional from author Jonathan Kahn, and I'm doing this because I had one of those random flip open the book to any page type of moments the other day, and I read words that I knew were totally meant for me to read, and then to read them to you now. So here they are, from the Book of Mysteries, the ongoing narrative between a very unique teacher and his ever-seeking student. The teacher took me back to the Chamber of Scrolls, to the scroll in the Ark, which he removed, and then read these words from Moses out loud. You shall count fifty days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. This, said the teacher, is the ordinance of the Feast of Shavuot, which takes place seven weeks or fifty days after Passover. The rabbis calculated it out and discovered that this was the same time that Moses ascended Mount Sinai to receive the law. Thus, the Shavuot became the day that commemorated the giving of the law. Over 1,000 years after the giving of the law, Jesus' disciples were together in Jerusalem, and the Spirit of God came upon them. It was the day that the new covenant was empowered by God's Spirit. It all happened on the Hebrew feast of Shavuot, when the rabbis of the Greek world had to come up with a Greek name for the Hebrew holy day. They called it the Feast of the 50th Day, or in Greek, Pentecost. So, Pentecost is the Hebrew Feast of Shavuot. Yes, he said. And what does that mean? It means that the Spirit of God was given to the believers on the very same day that the Law of God was given to Israel over a thousand years before. The Old Covenant and the New Covenant are joined together. They were both inaugurated on the very same day. And do you remember what happened when the law was given? No, sir. Judgment happened. People perished. And the number of those who perished? The ancient Hebrew, Exodus 32, 8, records the number, quote, was about 3,000. And you know what happened on that second Shavuot on Pentecost when the Spirit was given? Salvation happened, eternal life happened, and the number of those who came to new life? The ancient Greek, Acts chapter 2, 41, records the number, quote, was about 3,000, end quote. Two different languages, 
Hebrew and Greek, ages apart, yet the same exact expression. So about 3,000 died, and many centuries later, about 3,000 came to life on the same exact holy day. Yes, and so the Apostle Paul writes, the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The Spirit was given on the very same day as the law was given. Why? Because the law can tell us the will of God, but only the Spirit can give us the power to live it. Therefore, live by the Spirit of God, and you fulfill the will of God for your life. Just as precisely as the coming of the Spirit did on Shavuot, Pentecost. I am all in with you, Brother Jonathan. Amen. A quick side note here. As I get older and as I dig deeper than ever into the Bible, into its amazing content, I am more and more fascinated with, blown away by what I would refer to as the encoding that is inherent in the scriptures, proving again and again that our God is indeed the almighty master planner and fulfiller of his plans down to every detail. He is thoroughly and powerfully in charge. Well, of course, Jonathan Kahn's narrative was about the role of the Holy Spirit, the one who gives us the power to live and step with in harmony with our Father's plans, with his will for our lives. It's the Holy Spirit who provides all the power we need to do just that. And the Holy Spirit does even more. In line with what we've heard so far, I feel so strongly to share what I believe to be one of the most profound segments of Scripture verses in the Bible. Verses that explain, on an even deeper level, what the Holy Spirit's coming and His presence means for all of God's children. The Apostle Paul, again, was the one with the revelation, and his words are found in his second letter to the Corinthians. I'd like to read his words to you now, while interjecting a few of my own words. 2 Corinthians 3, 6-18 through God has enabled us to be ministers of His new covenant. This is a covenant not of written laws, but a covenant of the Spirit. The old written covenant ends in death, but under the new covenant, the Spirit gives life. The old way, with laws etched in stone, the Ten Commandments, it led to death, though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at the face of Moses. For his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading away. Explanation here. According to Exodus chapter 34, every time Moses came out of the tent of meeting or tent of dwelling, where Moses would meet alone with God, his face was shining bright with the glory of God, and the Israelites couldn't bear to look at it. They felt ashamed to look at it. They actually asked Moses to put a veil over his face every time he came out of the tent to hide the shining glory. Back to Paul's words now. He continues, Shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way now that the Holy Spirit is giving life? If the old way, which brings condemnation, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way which makes us right with God? In fact, the first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way which has been replaced was glorious, how much more glorious is the new which remains forever? Since this new way gives us confidence, we can be very bold. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face so the people of Israel would not see the glory, even though it was destined to fade away. But the people's minds were hardened, and to this day, whenever the Old Covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds so they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in Christ. Yes, even today, when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil, and they do not understand. Explanation again. At some point in Israel's history, it became the religious custom that before a priest or a rabbi read from the law the writings of Moses, they were required to hang a sacred veil around their neck and over their chest, over their heart, to protect their shameful heart 
from the glory that was supposedly coming off the pages of the Law of Moses. And Paul is saying here, they don't understand. They just don't get it. Paul concludes with these words, but whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. Dear friend, I so want those words to connect with your spirit. As Paul said, we're no longer in a covenant of written laws. We're in a covenant of the Spirit. The veil of shame has been taken away. We have to see this and remind ourselves of this, that we are sons and daughters of our Father in heaven, whose veils have been removed. We stand free and we live with our faces unveiled. His glory is on our face. We reflect that glory and we're growing in that glory through the power of the Holy Spirit. Dear Holy Spirit, how amazing you are. You brought this dear one of yours and me out of a covenant of written laws and into a new covenant that gives life. You are called Ruach, the very breath of life. You bring us peace in the middle of chaos. You bring us power to do our Father's will and you've removed the veil to reflect our Father's glory, to be a shining light for Him in a world of lost children, children who long for their veils to be removed, for your glory to shine on them. O Holy Spirit, move upon us again today and every day for the glory of our Father and for the glory of our Lord Jesus. Let it be. Thank you for listening to another episode of In Moments Like These with David Graham. And we hope that this podcast and this episode can be another tool and resource to help you in this walk of faith. If this podcast has made a difference in your life, we would love to hear from you. Visit us online at inmomentslikethese.com. That's inmomentslikethese.com.